My humble respect to Guru Mahan, Guru Piransya Sangram, Guru Piranyo, fellow Nyanis. Um, we've been covering for the last few satsang on Swamiji's I God philosophy. We've covered, um, you know, the different schools of thought, um, you know, different, uh, you know, we talked about Advaita, we talked about Dvaita, we talked about, uh, you know, the different uh, approaches. We also talked about the um, theist and atheist perspective. And, uh, and now I want to go a little bit more into some uh, more technical details of trying to understand Mahan's uh, uh, I got philosophy. And you'll see that um, some of the concepts will be very similar to what we covered the last time, but uh, with a much more deeper uh, analysis. <clears throat> I've always been asked this uh, question, you know, uh, why is it uh, very difficult? You know, um, how much effort do we need to really uh, put in to understand, um, you know, a philosophy like Mahan's teachings or even the meditational approach? There is a very simple rule um, that in anything we want to do, uh, we need to put in about 10,000 hours of uh, effort, roughly around 10,000. But that doesn't guarantee you of knowing, but you have to put in the effort to really know the technical details, you know, and, and uh, um, the effort is very important. So you'll see that in the I God book, um, Mahan talks about the meditation and the enlightenment process through Kundalini meditation in the later part of the chapters. But the first few chapters were actually the conceptual framework, um, some of the theoretical underpinnings, uh, the fundamentals of what God is, what the universe is, and what the self is. And we are still in the first uh, you know, uh, principle of Mahan, uh, and this is the, the kind of a final part of the first principle, which is on the concept of formless and form. <clears throat> Um, to some extent, I've actually spoken about this in a more broader context. So I'm going to bring it down to our own self. So here uh, we see that um, what Mahan speaks about the formless form is the following. He says that uh, creation or evolution originated from the formless. We covered that. We covered this, uh, you know, formless before our universe was constructed, our universe is four-dimensional, three-dimensional space and time, the fourth dimension. It was formless. So we had that primordial atom and Big Bang. So what Swamiji says here is that creation or evolution originated from that formless, that Yiru, that, you know, uh, unbounded, infinite, you know, substratum, you know, formless, dimensionless, right? And... We have covered that in detail on how the formless, you know, took on form. And uh, here Swamiji captures another way of how the creation or evolution originated from the formless into formless form. Uh, this is something, it's a new term that he introduces here. And I'll describe what that formless form is and finally to forms. So, so let's recap what Swamiji had before uh, of the Yiru. From there, he says that, um, you know, uh, nothing, something by chance. And I covered that in the earlier part of the satsangs, when we covered Irul and the principle of I and so on. From nothing, no thing. Thing means matter and energy. So prior to our universe, which is a thing, matter and energy, there was no thing. That means non-matter, non-energy, right? So that's nothing. Something appeared. And that something appeared, so that means from that infinite continuum, our four-dimensional universe appeared. And I also gave you the reason why that's the case, right? If it's infinite, then one of the possibilities is our four-dimensional universe. There could be other universe. And we talked about the concept of multiverses, right? So here, so nothing, something by chance. By chance means it's got a probability, a possibility, so this is why we see that the substratum, which we call Yirul, or in Swamiji's case, he calls it, you know, the big eye. This is what we call the infinite possibilities. So 
a part of that infinite possibilities and potentialities is emanated in all the creations in this four dimensional universe. So we wanna be able to discover if that DNA is from that formless and that's given form that a part of that formless DNA must be in the form. And this is what we're going to discover in today's satsang. How Swamiji captures that. So here, the whole idea of nothing, something by chance, that infinite possibilities and potentialities gave rise to our universe. And within that universe, the DNA of infinite possibilities and potentialities is embedded in that DNA. So we see that infinite stars and galaxies and, you know, particles and, you know, and, and infinite, even on our Earth, we see infinite, uncountable creatures and one cell to, you know, more complex cellular biological beings, you know, including if you see human beings, we can count human beings. I think today we have somewhere about 7.5 billion to 8 billion people and it's growing and, uh, and, uh, and whether the earth can support it or not is a different story. But within that, in, within that, you know, seven to eight billion, you have different, different characters, infinite characters and behaviors and so on. So we see that, that infinite possibilities and potential is embedded in this. So Swamiji talks about this formless form. So the, our own creation and evolution started from the formless, you know, and into a formless form and finally to forms. Let's go a little bit more in detail. So what's forms? So let's come back to our own sense, you know, that um, forms are objects which can be caught and perceived by the five senses. So I am seeing this computer, I'm seeing my laptop. So the laptop is a form, I can touch it, I can feel it, I can sense it, right? So there is form. I can see my hands, I can see my body, you know, I can sense, you know, my, my brain functioning, you know, so all that are objects, right? So, so our biological being is an object, right? And uh, it's a form. I can see, you know, uh, my family members, I see my dog, I see my neighbors, I see my car, all these are forms, objects. And we all can cognize that. So this is very clear. The second part he talks about is formless form. Now, this is the part that is many people a little bit uh, confusing. What do we mean by formless form? These are things that we feel, you know, we experience, right? Things such as heat and cold, we experience it, you know? Of course we have our, we, we can, you know, uh, we, <clears throat> we drink a <clears throat> cold water, cold water is the object, but the feeling of coldness is the formless form. The coldness is that formless form. So that experience is the formless form that he's talking about. So the, the, what we feel, what we taste, what we smell, what we hear, what we see, what we cognize is the formless form. So you may be, uh, so for a corpse, right, you can pour cold water. Yes, the water is cold, but the feeling is not there, right? Similarly, you may have a hand that may be numb, right? So when a, 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 a needle pricks it, you can feel pain. But when the thing is numb, you don't feel it. So the experience is not there. So we see that that experience is what we call the formless form. And so, so while we have an object that brings in that information, the experiencing part is what Swamiji calls us the formless form, right? So again, but it cannot be caught by hand. You know, how do I capture the experience of, uh, you know, uh, a smell or, or taste, you know? Yes, I need to have a vehicle, but you know, uh, the whole aroma of a nice food that is, you see side and, you know, maybe sound of cooking and smell, all that gives you an experience, but you cannot touch it with your hand, right? So the hand brings in some part of the information, but the entire experience is untouchable. 
So yeah, it comes from form, but it's formless in its experience, right? And this is the part that is so important that uh, though our senses, we've got five senses that brings that information, there is an important component in our, our brain and our mind that actually brings it together. That's called ego. Ego is not the pride factor. Most people misunderstand that. Ego is that which brings all the information to give you an experience. And if that experience is continuously, you experience it, it forms you know, your thoughts and, you know, and that experience transforms into a personality, right? Ultimately, if you have a lot of good, positive, inspirational vibration, you become an inspirational personality. If all our life has been, you know, really difficult, challenging, you know, uh, you know, uh, so we see that we, we get a different personality because all that information is coordinated and that experience relates to what we call that personality. And that coordinating factor is called the, the uh, ego. So, and sometimes people have all these things and the personality forms a very pride factor. And that's what we call ego sometimes, you know, so it's not the right term, uh, but actually what it means is that that which gives us that experience. So Swamiji calls that the formless form. From form, we have that experience that's formless form. And then Swamiji then goes on to define, you see what he's doing, is he's defining like a scientist. And scientists have this interesting uh, approach that you've got to mean what you say and say what you mean. Everything is deciphered, right? So, um, and here we see that he talks about the formless. Uh, formless is very different. It's about our thoughts. Our thoughts can be from that our material experiences, but you no, know, sometimes we get thoughts that are not, you know, tied to what uh, we are seeing or, or observing. You know, we've got ideas, conceptions, you know, and our brain. And, and which the intellect uses to introspect, contemplate, reflect, and it comes up with an idea. Never been seen, you don't see it at all, but it brings up this and, you know, so Swamiji calls this formless. For example, um, you know, in a short second, I can be in the moon, you know, I can decouple space and time and I can think about the moon and, as though I'm being in the moon or the sun or the beginning of the universe. So this formless is part of, in, you know, embedded in all of us that transcends space and time. So Swamiji says that within our own biology, we have that form and that form, within that form, we have the formless form that gives us that experience. And within that, we also have this formless, which gives us thoughts, ideas, conceptions, and we can transform that formless into formless form. You know, we, that is how we take our thoughts, we put it into experiments, we test it out, and then if it works out, we create objects or uh, things that becomes form. So again, you know, we see that, you know, it is something that we can't capture it with our hands or you know our, our you know uh, material uh, apparatus, but yet it is it's there. So the type of thoughts, the type of ideas and conception depends on the type of jnana or the expansion of our intellect and wisdom, and how creative it is, how curious it is, how exploratory it is. So we see that Swamiji then, so it's very clear from Swamiji's concept that what form is, what formless form is, and what formless is. Why this is really important is because this sets the stage for the next stage of development. Well, how does this tie to that Irul concept? How does it tie to us as, 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 a, as a biological being and a spiritual being? So I'm going to start off again with a simple concept of this Swamiji's Iru, which is formless, dimensionless, you know, uh, colorless, if you want to call it that way. From that formless, we have, you know, um, it's what Swamiji con, you know, uh, identifies as infinite potential and possibilities. You know, 
higher order continuum. From that higher order continuum, we are all sitting down here, uh, though in that higher order continuum, but we are now uh, percolating and permeating the higher order continuum through this you know, four-dimensional biology or the four-dimensional biological form to experience this material world and trying to describe this formless via this material four-dimensional uh, biological uh, entity. So, so let me give you a description. So this is the formless, and I'll tell you all of this is infinite, so it must be part and parcel of us. And Swamiji talks about this formless nothing creates this something, you know, and this something is all of us. And, and that form is, has gone through an evolutionary process, right? From that higher order continuum, you know, infuse that higher infinite into the primordial atom to create our universe, the four dimensional universe that has space and time. And from that through 13.8 billion years of evolution that we have arrived to the thinking human beings, the homo sapiens, right? So what do we know? So in all this evolution, we probably are the only species that have asked, where did all this come from, right? From that one cell to the more complex being and here we are today trying to explore and understand this whole universe and the creator. So from this formless emerged this form. And this is the form. So we have the body and the brain that nature's embedded is the form. You know, and we, we have matter and energy. So we've got the body that is made out of carbon, oxygen, and the brain too. Uh, we have all those various, you know, uh, uh, building blocks that make the body. So we all have that. And um, the body then is the form, is able to have all the sensory perception and the form um, is able to capture frequency. It's able to capture forms in frequency. And the forms and frequency is channeled through our hardware called the senses and it's processed in the brain. So it's still form, so we can touch somebody, we can feel the touch of that person. That person is a form, our hands are form, our brain that is analyzing is form. This electrical pulse, we can measure it, we can touch it, we can experience it, is also form. But all that forms into an experience that becomes formless. So, so this formless form, so from the form, we are able to experience the formless. So I say, ah, this person's body is warm. This person's body is cold. This person, you know, is, is in this way. This person's hair is like this, this person. So you can touch it, you can experience it. So we see that that physical form, you have an experience. Similarly, you go to a particular place, a physical place, you have an experience, right? So this is, so, so I'm taking you through that bio, the, the kind of continuum that Swamiji talks about. And from there, we get formless. So we've got all this experience. And from that experience, we start exploring our mind, our thoughts. It may be related to what we have experienced or things that we have seen, or it may not be, right? So for example, a, a musician, um, uh, who learns all the form of music and playing instrument. But on a fine day at 4.35 o'clock in the morning, he sits down in the state of bliss. He composes a song from nowhere. Beautiful. So you see a lot of great you know, musicians, composers come up with beautiful melodies. You know, and, uh, and where does it come from? It comes from that formless. Sometimes we say it comes from the inspiration, it comes from God, it comes from, uh, you know, nature, right? You see that sometimes many of them don't mingle with many people, they just go off in, in nature. And you see people like Mahans, you know, the Rumis of the world, 
you know, the uh, great composers like Tyagaraja or the uh, great composers such as Mozart and, you know, uh, Ramanujam. I'm not sure many of you all are familiar with this great mathematician called Ramanujam. He used to come up with great formulas. And G.H. Hardy, who was a supervisor, asked him, where did you come? He said, I just got it from God, you know, the, the, the God he was praying to, right? And Hardy used to tell him, you know, great, you've got this formula, but now you've got to show the proof of this. The, the final equation does not matter. You've got to take us through the process. So while you have the thoughts and ideas and conceptions, now for people to use it, you need to show how this form can give an experience or learning, and that could translate into form that benefit people. So you see that there's a nice dynamic between form, formulas, form, and formless. So we see that we observe, so for somebody who's very creative, who's also meditative, introspective, they get the best out of both worlds. They see the world around them. They experience the world around them. They learn from that. They chalk up great thoughts, great ideas, and they bring it into that introspective and those ideas just flourishes to a different level. And then they bring it back and, and enriches the formless form and the form. And that beautiful dynamics between form, formless form and formless comes back to the form. You know, <clears throat> this reminds you of how the flow of water from ocean, it evaporates into clouds, the pure water evaporates into cloud. And from the cloud, uh, you know, it traps into, you know, uh, comes back to land, into the river. It flows from the river back to the ocean. In that same way as how the universe, the formless, has imprinted that DNA into the primordial atom that you have, you know, uh, the atoms form, you know, or the what we call the potential energy. There's a dance between the potential energy and the dynamic energy, right? So potential energy becomes dynamic energy and then it goes back. In that same way, we see that, you know, atoms and molecules, you know, coalesce together, you know, form new substance and then dissolves. So there is creation, there is sustenance, and then there is dissolution back again. So you have the generation, operation, and dissolution, GOD, that is imprinted across in our universe. In that same way, it is also embedded in our DNA. We see that, you know, the formless gives us a formless form of an experience. And in that creative experience, we can form. So this is where we see these dynamics within cosmic intelligence that infuses formless form and form. And similarly, one who's very creative, who understands this dynamic, observes the material world, experiences it, learns from it, divinize it, you know, divinize the thoughts, the ideas and the conceptions and take it to a different level and then bring it back as experience in this four-dimensional world with a higher order experience, infusing it into the four-dimensional and actioning it. And this is what Swamiji speaks about. You never run away from your desires, you divinize your desires. So this beautiful dynamics within form, formless, and formless form and formless continuously, the cycle takes place, like how the water, the rain, the clouds, that continuous cycle as one goes through their journey, as the cycle takes place, you see that the formless is unbounded, the Irul is infinite potential and possibilities infuses in every facet of your experiences, life experiences. And you see that your thought becomes <clears throat> divinized, your speech becomes divinized, your actions become divinized. So this link Swamji talks about here uh, in this dynamics is very important. 
particularly, you know, this is why he says introspect, contemplate, reflect, and meditate. Introspect on what? Introspect on the form. And when you introspect on the form, you ask the question, where does the form come from? Is it outside me or inside me? So we know it's inside me. How is it inside me? You know, it's all the experiences that we are getting. And that's what gives me the cognition of this material world. Where does the experience come from? So we bring to this notion of this big eye or consciousness. And this beautiful dynamics is, is very important to understand. So this is why Swamiji says then that, you know, this whole process of that formless form in all this, he says that the seer is greater than the seen. Who is the seer? Seer is none other than that who is observing the world, creating that experiential process and the experiencer himself. So we see that that dynamics, if one understands this process, you see that you understand the seer, the seeing process and the seen, right? So, you know, and, and the seer is, if the seer is limited, the seeing process is limited, the seen will be limited. If the seer is enlightened, the seer is universal, the he seer is wholesome, the seer is paripurnam, the seer is complete, the seeing process becomes complete, paripurnam, and the seen becomes paripurnam, complete, wholesome. And this is what that meditational cycle of introspection, contemplation, reflection, and tapas or deep meditation gives you better introspective power, better reflective power, better, you know, uh, your meditation improves. It reminds me so much of, you know, uh, the Dvaita philosophy that, you know, the more intensive your bhakti becomes, the more elevated your jnana becomes, the more higher your jnana becomes, the more bhakti improves. And that cycle, we're seeing that similar cycle happens, that when we intensify our introspection, contemplation, reflection, our meditation improves, we have get a better clarity of thought and mind. We have better understanding of the seeing process. We're able to then have a more complete understanding of what we are seeing or what we are observing or what we are cognizing. That feeds back. So that feedback loop continuously takes place. And that is what the enlightening process is that Swamiji is trying to speak about. So here is what he's saying is the seer is greater than the seen. So that process of the seer the seeing process and the seeing, one needs to understand very, very clearly. And this brings us to this whole notion that, you know, if uh, I was uh, in this morning's uh, satsang that I put, where if one understands this, then you would not, you know, uh, break the hearts. You know, what does that mean? You would not uh, be injurious to yourself, nor other people. Because you see that, you know, all of us have that, you know, DNA of the divinity. So we become more and more, you know, graceful in our thought, in our you know, speech, and also in our actions. So this is the first door of what the GP Mahan's value is. And uh, if one understands this, you see that before you walk into the doors of any spiritual abode, the question is, have you walked into the doors of your spiritual abode? Because if you do not walk into the doors within your own spiritual abode, you would not see the divinity anywhere else. If you see the divinity within yourself, you'll see divinity everywhere. So this is what Swamiji is saying here, is that the seer is greater than the seen. Sandoshan. Yes, 